song before our lesson this morning. If you're able, please stand at this time as we sing. I'm satisfied with just having you having you with us. You know, I don't know, this fall back thing messed with me. I, I, I started waking up at 5.30 and look at the clock, I'd doze and say, oh, oh I'm late now, and I'd look, no, it's 5.35 now. And so I came in this morning, I'm getting ready for my sermon, I put my sermon notes up here, and you know, I don't use them a lot, but I want them there in case, and I came up right, during Bob, right before Bob's class, and it was next week's sermon laying here. So I ran back, switched those real quick, and then just then I had a heart attack moment because I could not find my clicker. I can't talk without a clicker. It's a rule. I'm not allowed to anymore. So anyway, okay, parents, you can reel your toes back out. I'm done preaching at you for a few weeks, or at least until halfway through. No, I'm done for a while. Uh, today's lesson, we're going to talk about wisdom that you can count on. Uh, and I say this is not, this is aimed at parents, but this is aimed at all of us. We all need to understand where we get our wisdom from. If, if you don't seek the right advice, you're not going to know what to do. I mean, can you imagine that you, you go up to, uh, uh, well, he's not here, I can pick on him. You know, I'm not going to Bruce Harbach and ask him investment advice. I'm going to go to my investment guy and ask him. Likewise, I'm not going to this kid that grew up in Chicago that does my investment stuff and ask him how to plant corn. Not going to work. If I want wisdom, I'm not going to go to my worldly friends. Uh, and yes, we all have friends that live out in the world. And I'm not going to them for advice. I want to go seek it from the right person or personage in this count, uh, count to... Uh, to get my advice. So we're going to start with the reading. It's short. We're going to start with the reading and then we'll get into the lesson. This morning's reading is from Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, verses 1, and then I'm going to jump over to verses 13 and 14. It says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Verse 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. You know, it's funny, Josh uh, Bolin is back there on the controls this morning, and uh, Josh has a habit of looking to see how many slides are in the sermon, and then gets nervous, so uh, i just just saying that. Okay, so 
the first step towards wisdom is to know where to go. Remember your creator. We have to develop a commitment in our lives that we're going to ask first what God would do. We want to know what his answer would be first. Now, when Allison and I moved uh, from Freeport the first time and we were looking at houses down in Georgia, one of the first questions we asked was, where is there an active congregation? Because it's hard, and I mentioned this to Mike, it, it, they, they live a ways, it's hard to stay faithful and active when you live too far from a church body. It's difficult. So we started looking, where is, is a group of people that we can worship with? And, and that we can, can be a part of that family so that we can take our meals together as the first century Christians did, so that we could enjoy time together as they did, so we can pray and study together. I, isn't that the great advantage of living and working in Freeport? We are all so close to each other. I had a... Um, I, regularly I get these calls from religious survey groups like Barna and, and others, and one day they said, how far is your commute to your office? And I went, well, that's tough. I said, do you want to know at the height of rush hour? Or at the height of rush hour, what's it take? I said, about five minutes, max. And they went, that's not funny. I said, no, it's true, though. I, you didn't look to see where you were calling before you called. We need to teach our children, as we're bringing them up, to hang on every word of God. Because each word is important. He gave us everything we need. Every answer to every question is in there. And so, if we are students of the word, the answers come to us. Now, this is why I encourage you. Read and get familiar with God's word as you're younger. Because what will happen is, you don't memorize. I, I don't have lots of verses memorized. I'm just, that's not my thing. I'm not good at that. I try. Uh, we've got friends from West Chicago. Tim Miller can spout verses all that he and his brother John, they can just roll them out. I'm not that smart. But when you familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with it by reading them and reading them and reading them, you know what it says and you know how to go find it. And, and I personally believe that's just as important as being a person that can say word for word for word all the time. That's a great skill. Be thankful for what God has done for you. You need to realize it. I'm just trying to think of an example. When something bad happens, let's say you have a tire go bad, and you go out in the morning, and you look, and recently this happened to us. I went out, and there's a hole not in the bottom, in the sidewall, a new tire. And what do they tell you when you go to the place to fix it? Can't fix the sidewall, sorry, you're going to have to go buy a new tire. Well, I could look at it like there's money gone, you know. I don't want to spend this money on a new tire. And the days of $35 tires at Walmart are gone. But, you know, you could also look at it. I could have been driving 70 miles an hour to Rockford and had this sidewall blow out. So we look for the thing that we say... God, and whether God had a hand in it or not, you've heard me say this a million times, we praise Him anyway. God may not have even been thinking of my tire that day, and that's okay. He still gets the praise because I could be dead, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your part you play in everything. And love God with all that you have. Now, you probably would like to say with all your heart, but it's more than that. It's with all of your emotion, your heart. It's with all of your soul, that inner being that moves us and guides us, and with all of your thoughts. Because Christianity is, against what the world would tell you, a rational religion. It is not irrational to believe in God. There is evidence both scientific, archaeological, and emotional that God exists. Nature cries out there is a God. If you don't believe that, go out on one of these beautiful crisp fall mornings shortly after the sun comes up and watch nature wake up. It's phenomenal. And then trust Him. Trust Him with all your being. When you doubt Him, trust Him anyway. 
When you are so heartbroken over something, lean on God anyway. Uh, I guess I can announce it right now as opposed to later, but Billy Good's back in the hospital. She has pneumonia again, and she's not doing well. And I, I don't say this to, to hurt uh, Tom, because it is his mom, but a while back we were talking to her, and she was very sick, and she said, I am ready to go. I'm tired of this. Obviously, God's not ready to take her because she's so strong. She fights so hard. But yet, see, she has put her trust not in living a physical life. She knows there's something better. That's why the service last weekend for Isabel was so wonderful because we know there is better. And so we miss people, but there's better. There's something greater to be had. So trust him that, one, he hears your prayers. Trust him that he cares about the outcome of what you're praying about. And trust him that he knows and will do what is best for you, even when you don't see it. I, I don't know about you, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have prayed for something? It seemed like it didn't come true, but years later you saw that God worked for the best for you? I know I have. Many times over. At the time, I thought, you didn't do what I asked, Lord. You know, and he doesn't answer out loud. So it's a one-sided argument. But then later on down the road, you just say, wow, he was so much smarter than me. He knew what I needed so much more than I did. Um, when Alice and I became foster parents the first time, it, it didn't break the bank, but it was financially extremely difficult on us. We were a young couple. We weren't making a lot of money. We already had one child. And, and it... It really hurt a lot for several years. But now I would not trade that time that we serve God in that way for anything in the world. I wouldn't. I think it made us better parents. I know it made us much more compassionate to other races, other economic, you know, levels of people because we saw how people would treat us because of our multiracial family and things. And, and, and now I understand better about bias and hatred. It made us better. Thank God. And trust Him with all your might. And then the next part of that verse says, remember the Creator. Remember, God created everything except you by the power of His thought. Now you, He created, remember what we said a few weeks ago, how? With His hands. He formed you. Everything else he just said, let's do this. And it happened. And God created all that by thought. Now look at how everything in nature has to work together so intricately. We are able to sustain ourselves on this planet because of where he placed it in the solar system and how it moves. They say in nature one of the greatest uh, ways to indicate when we're having a problem with pollution and stuff are the amphibians, frogs, salamanders. God has made them so sensitive to change. And scientists now understand one of the best ways to see what's happening in an area is study them. Just a lowly frog is better than any chemical test they can take. And then more than that, the Bible tells us that Christ keeps it all working by the power of his willpower. Jesus is thinking at this moment, and I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant, that's true. Jesus is thinking right now, keep gravity going, keep gravity going. Keep, and aren't we lucky? It kind of be a mess in here. You know? Christ is saying by the power of his will, Rick, keep breathing, Rick, keep breathing. Again, another mess on our hands if he doesn't. He keeps everything going by his willpower. And, and that shows how much he loves us. It shows how much he cares for us. Again, I'm not being flippant. You boil these down to their barest, the cells in your body hold together because he tells them to. Because he wills that to happen. And we can depend on him because everything else in the world depends on him. Nature understands who is their creator. They do what God created them to do. 
It is only man that decides, I don't like what God made me or made us to be or us to do. I, I'm going to go against that. God loved us, depend on him to keep these things working. So no matter what happens in your life, no matter what happens in your sphere of influence, no matter what happens with your job, depend on his word to give you the answers you need to work it out. Trust his word. I, I know I've used it before, but I, I love this quote from Brother Marshall Keeble. Somebody asked a question. He said, well, I don't rightly know where to tell you to go find it, but I tell you, if you start in Genesis and stop in Revelation, you'll find the answer. It's there. You know, good wisdom from an old-time preacher. But by the way, that man started hundreds of congregations around the country. Didn't have any more than an elementary education. That's what God's Word can do for us when we just trust His Word. The answers are there. And then it says, Remember your Creator before the evil days come. I, I hate to do this, but there's one thing I can promise you. Bad stuff happens to good people. We, we talked about the other night, you know, uh, about how some of the bad stuff and how can a loving God allow... It's in His hands. Bad things happen. And it's not God's fault, by the way. We're going to blame this one on Adam and Eve. They started it. They opened the door to it. Jesus is stemming it. But until the judgment day, bad things are going to happen to good people. And so we need to understand that. We need to teach our children to be aware of what sin is before they're immersed in it. I had a talk with uh, one of my grandchildren. I won't embarrass that one. I, we had a talk the other day about classmates that say the word, oh, my God. And I said, well, we don't say that in our family. And the reason we don't say it is because we know God is real. And we love God so much that I'm not going to waste his name on, on silly things. Let's find other things to say. We don't need to say that one. Teach your children the whys and what. Don't just, just tell them no. No is easy, right? Tell them no and why. Let them understand. And, and, and I will tell you, at the youngest age, they'll start understanding. Before you think they're hearing and understanding, they are. As the world becomes more evil, your child must learn to better and better discern that good from evil. Now, the world doesn't get any more evil. I, it hit its peak in the days before the flood. Uh, it's just evil. It's always evil. But what gets more evil is the, the world around them. They get around more and more people and more and more events. And uh, again, use this easy thing, flip on the TV and see how many shows try to introduce evil into your family through the language. I mean, shows that y'all know the biggest fight in our married life is over Discovery Channel. She hates it, I love it. Or the Nature Channel, or Nat Geo Wild, or... No, anyway, if it has animal in it, I'm on it. But the thing is, even on those shows, even the most mundane, the language that pops up in them, and you have to say, oh, I can't watch that. I'm not going to listen to that. And I told you a couple weeks ago, even a potty training DVD at our house we have to turn off part of it because they're talking about evolution. What that has to do with potty training, I don't know. In cartoon characters, I don't get it. But they do. Teach your children to discern good from evil. And when you're confronted with it, when it comes home, don't just say, oh, we don't believe that. Tell them why. Dinner time is a great time for families to get together and discuss these things. Time to teach your children. Remember what they said in the Old Testament? When you rise up, when you sit down, when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed, when you walk out the door, when you walk by your gatepost, as you walk down the road, all of those are great times to teach your children. But that means you've got to make time to be with your children. You've got to find time to sit there to have these discussions. And then he says, I have no delight in them. Without knowing God and without a desire to please God, they lost the desire to do godly things. Um, Bob mentioned this morning in his class, uh, study of denominationalism and things, in his class he mentioned this morning that because 
I am baptized, and because I worship with Christians, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly, but, and because I take communion, I am then driven to obey and do good things. Not for my uh, salvation do I do the good things. I do those because of the other. Because he saved me, I worship him, and that spurs me to more and more action. And so I live better and do better because of that. We need to do the same. We need to understand God and have a desire to do for him. Uh, the, the clothing giveaway. I, um, last night I was training and testing therapy dogs to work at the hospital. I had a whole bunch of them. And somebody said, oh, Jeff, wasn't it your church having a clothing giveaway? Most of them do rummage sales. I said, I know. We want to give clothes to those in need, not charge them money for something else that they can't afford. Let's give it to people that need it. You know, we're spurred on to good action. And even bringing your children here to help sort the clothes is a teaching moment. Even when they complain and say they're tired from carrying one box. Yeah, it's, it's teaching moments. I know you didn't say one box. It was two boxes, but it's okay. Uh, now, you know, it, it, it's teaching moments when we share God's love and share God's work and people see us enjoying our time together and, and having fun and making fun of each other and picking on each other. That's all part of being in a family. And the church is family. We need to understand that. While some were here, some were helping Pam. You know, the church is family. That's what we do. And, and when pleasing yourself is more important than God, you, you cannot please God. You will not. It's not possible. When every sentence ends with me and mine and I, you're not thinking clearly. We need to remember, the, in wisdom, remember God. And then he says, when everything is done, there's a bottom line to it. And the bottom line is this. People don't lack knowledge or understanding. It's a desire. We all have the ability, everyone has the ability to know God. Now, we all have different abilities and capacities for study and, and, and retention. I, I get that. But everything has the ability, every person has the ability to know God at their level. It's a lack of desire that, that causes the issues. I mean, the person he's talking about here in this section of verses is because of life's attractions, willfully choose to ignore God. They don't care. It's, it's, it's too hard to lose an hour of sleep. It's too hard to get up and go do something good for someone else. It's too hard to see someone in need and, and reach out compassionately to them. It's too hard to speak to a coworker because they make fun of you if you talk to them about God. That's, a lack of that's just a lack of desire. It's selfishness. We saw the verses. So I'm, I'm going to read again because we're going to get into the next section of it. So the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God, keep His commandments... Because this applies to everyone. For God will bring every act to judgment. Everything that's been hidden. Boy, don't you hate that part. Oh, everything hidden. I hate that part. Whether it's good or bad. So, the second step in this seeking wisdom is to preserve your heart. Take care of yourself. Protect yourself. Has anybody here run into children out there that don't respect authority? All the teachers are wanting to jump up and down and wave their arm, me, 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 me. And they have no respect. If you watch any of the cop shows, you see people just have no respect for authority. Um, when I grew up, that even included people like doctors because we would have to get dressed up like we were going to Wednesday night Bible study. Not quite Sunday, but Wednesday night Bible study to go to the doctor. You know, why? Because we respected their knowledge and, and we were going to show respect to them for what they could do, what they did do. So we have to teach our children and we have to believe in and fear God because that's the first step in preserving our hearts. That's the first step in understanding what authority is and, and why it's important. Um, as, as you know, through my work, but also even like here in Haiti, I have seen people where anarchy is taking place, where, where because of like the earthquake, everything had fallen down. I told you about the, the, 
riot the one day over, over a few bags of beans. And there was an old lady that was trying to scoop up some that were spilled on the floor, and a police officer was hitting her, beating her, because she was taking those. They weren't hers yet. And it's just, it all falls, it's a lack of respect for God and God's way. Now, I will tell you, if we expect respect for God and for the church, we have to be people that, that show respect to others, that are loving to others. We're not mean-spirited. Um, you should never hate anyone. Your opening line to get someone to come to Christ is not, well, you're going to hell like you stand right now. Might work on one in a million. But I hadn't run into that one yet. We bring people to God because we show them we love them and respect them. They ask why we're different, and then we share with them why we're different. We have to respect the God that blesses us. When someone does good things to you, doesn't that make you feel good? Doesn't that make you happy? We have to respect the God that protects us. Uh, if, you, if you think God doesn't protect you, then why do you pray that you'll get better when you're sick? Why do you, why do, you know, we take the youth group and we go outside and before we get in the van, let's all have a prayer for protection before we drive. If we don't believe in it, why do it? God protects. God provides a long life to those who show wisdom and respect Him. Now, that does not necessarily mean He extends the natural born years of humankind. What it means is he helps keep you from doing stupid things when you're young that will get you killed. Provides you a longer life, his wisdom. And once fear or respect, either way you want to use that word, reverence, are born, sincere wish, uh, worship will follow. I personally remember when in my life church went from a thing we did as a family you know, week in, week out. When you're a kid, it's, it's a little burdensome. To the time I realized that, that Jesus was not a Savior, He was my Savior. That God was not a God, He was my God. And all of a sudden I realized, and I told you it took me until I was in college to really get it. I realized I didn't have to go to church. I wanted to go to church. I didn't have to be do things with other Christians. I needed to do things with other Christians because it made me stronger. And like I said, maybe you got it quicker. I'm a slow learner. But when we get to that point, life changes. I don't now live in fear of sinning and going to hell. I live in fear of disappointing God, of not doing everything I can for my God. Same way, we've got to keep His commandments. We have to protect what we learn about God. It means put a hedge around. That's a phrase I've used more and more when I pray for someone that's been baptized. We ask for a hedge of protection. Now that philosophy comes from the old, from New Testament era, no, Old Testament era. Um, but it's when the when the shepherds would bring the sheep in. They were out in the wilderness, and they would use shrubbery or rocks or whatever to build a wall around them. He couldn't go to sleep until he had done that, because otherwise, you know, sheep are dumb. They'd just wander off. And they'll get eaten by something bigger than them. And so you would put a hedge of protection around them to keep the bad things out. We need to do that with our children. Put a hedge of protection. We need to pray for God to put a hedge of protection around us. You don't have to use those words, but that philosophy is sound. And we don't allow trials or passions to cause us to drift away. Too often, the littlest bump in the road can cause some people to, to leave. Well, they hurt my feelings. They said this. Or, uh, I don't like the, the color. I, we had a debate the other night, Don Farmer, about the color of pu the pews. And we were discussing who picked the fabric for these pews. It's me, and I'm not going to name it. I, I blamed it on Roger Watts. He blames it on Diane. I think she blames it on Donnie. I'm not sure. Yeah. But we were just saying, you know, why did we pick this? Look, there's, there's nothing holy about the fabric on these. We're going to need to replace it soon. And there's nothing holy about the fabric. And it's sure not worth somebody leaving the church over. 
We made a bad choice when we bought this fabric. It doesn't last. If you're sitting on a tack right now, you understand why <laughs> this was bad choice in fabric because it keeps pulling, the tacks keep popping out, stabbing people where they don't want to be stabbed in the middle. It does get more amens as they jump up and then they're embarrassed and they have to yell amen because they don't, you know, what else do I do now that I've jumped up in the middle of Jeff's sermon? Now, it, you know, people will leave the church over stuff like that. We, we need to not allow these trials. And passions, that's desires for something other than what is godly. And here's the secret. We are all attracted by things that aren't godly. Satan makes them look good for a reason. And if you say that there is nothing out there that's bad that attracts you, I'm sorry, you're a liar. Or you're a saint. I know we're all saints. It's a euphemism. Uh, you know, we, we all have something out there that tries to pull us away from God. You're stronger than that. You're just stronger than that. And no commands lead us to give up on friendships, or, sorry, his commands should lead us to give up on friendships that are not healthy or godly. Now, I know the scripture teaches we have to be in the world to convert people of the world. Yes. But if you have a friendship or a connection with somebody that is pulling you away more than you're pulling them towards God, you need to cut that one off. You're doing no good. Now, keep trying to teach, obviously. Y'all have heard me talk. I've got a group of friends that I do dogs with. I have made very little headway with them. But also, you don't see me going out to eat with them and hanging out with them and stuff. Why? Because I know their influence that they're trying to project would have more influence on me than I'm able to have on them. They don't want to hear it right now. And so, I keep that connection. I answer the questions. We talk about God. Talked about Him yesterday. But we're not friends in that way. You know, we're just good acquaintances that like each other. Third, we've got to learn to live a life of no regrets. That's what I said when I know sin doesn't control me anymore, and all of a sudden I realize that that's not the determining factor. You cannot keep anything secret from God. Again, hate that one. Because we all think we got sneaky and got away with something. You didn't. He was there. He saw it. If, if we really, truly believe that God is omnipresent, that he's everywhere at once, if we really, truly believe that Jesus is omnipresent, if we really, truly believe that the Spirit is omnipresent, always with us, i got to say there's some things we wouldn't be doing, folks. But we think, we look around and we don't see them, so they're not there. And that's just that Satan trying to trick you. God is gracious and just. Absolutely. One of the things I pray for in my private prayer life regularly is that God is more gracious than Scripture leads me to think He is. Now, God is extremely gracious. But I hope that beyond what I've seen defined by my study of the Word, I hope it goes this much further. I, I hope it does. Because if it goes this much further, then more people are going to get saved. Now, I don't live my life for that extra. I don't preach for that extra. I hope it's there. But on the other side of that coin is just. God is just. And we need to understand that. So we need to live our life where we have no regrets about the things we're doing, the things we're saying. Uh, I, I love the scripture I got up there for you. And I, I know I, I don't read them a lot of times. I leave them for you to see. But Jonah, just kids, I'll tell you a story. There was this man named Jonah, and he was a good man. But God said, I need you to go out, and I need you to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the worst city you've ever seen. It was worse than New York City, and to a southern boy, that's the worst place on earth. We're scared of it for some reason. So anyway, it, it was bad. And God says, Jonah, I need you to go preach to those people and tell them who I am. And Jonah, of course, jumped up and ran the other way. He did not want to do it. In fact, we all know the story of the big fish, right? Jonah went, trying to get away, got thrown overboard, got swallowed by a fish, stayed there three days, puked up. I love that part, sorry. Uh, was expelled from the belly of this great fish. And he went and did what God said. And, and there was this, everyone listened. It was amazing. Later on, 
God's talking to him because he's just disappointed because they fell back into their sin right away. And he's disappointed and he's sitting there pouting one day. And he's hot. So God makes a plant. It's hard to say magically, but it's not. It's miraculously spring up out of the ground, come up, got so big in just minutes, it gave him shade. And he was sitting there thinking, well, I may be pouting, but this sure feels good to sit in the shade instead of the sun. I like this. God decided to teach him a lesson. He sent a bug that ate the plant, and the plant fell over dead, and now he's sitting in the sun again, and he's still pouting. And God said, Jonah, you're all sad and upset because this plant died. You didn't put it there. You didn't create it. I did. It came quickly, and it died quickly. Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry about so great a city? If you're going to feel sorry for one plant that died, shouldn't I feel sorry for this huge city that is so sinful? God is gracious and just. His justice is for every act, whether good or bad. You do good, you will get, you will get good from God. And you'll get opportunity to do more good, by the way, with it. You do bad, God sees it. And God is just. And he has mercy, but he does judge us. God has mercy, but he still sees and judges our actions, our words, our thoughts, our deeds. You know, too many people want to lean on just the mercy without the realization that there is judgment and justice. So, the answer, live a life of faith. If you live a life of faith, then when you sin, the, justice, or, or the judgment is different. Because he says, that was one thing you did that is not in your character. It's not who you are as a Christian. I'm going to forgive that one. Blood of Christ has got that one. But when we are living that way all the time, he says, ah, no. You have given up on the blood of Christ. You don't care anymore. And if you don't care, I can't care for you that way. I can't give you that. Remember, God never abandons us. We walk away from him. God never abandons us. He walks away from him. Uh, we walk away from him. So, wisdom you can count on. I thought there was another slide. That's next week's sermon that I put on the, up here this morning. I want you to, So remember two things today. When in doubt, check God's word. The answer's there. When in doubt, check his word. Second thing is the reminder of one of the parables there was a man, he had two sons, and one of the sons came up to him and demanded, Father, give me what is due to me. I want my share of the inheritance now before you die. Kind of rude. That's what he did. The father, not wanting to say no, there's another lesson for parents. Sometimes we've got to say no. Father, not wanting to say no, said, okay, gave him his money, and because he was young and immature, he went out, he got a bunch of friends together, because you always got friends when you got money, and they spent all the money on wild living through wild parties. All of a sudden, he's broke, and guess what? The friends are gone. And he gets so low down that he is living in a pig pen because he's got no money to pay for a place to sleep, and he's trying to eat what the pigs leave over. If it's not good enough for a pig to eat, I sure don't want it. So he goes home. Now, in the meantime, as he's coming home, the Scripture, and here's, here's the kicker for this, the Scripture says the father saw him from afar off. What that means is... And what is implied by that and what we can take from that is the father stood there looking down the road every day in hopes of seeing his son. He, he didn't just luck into seeing him that one day. He was waiting for his son to come home. Some total of this is in the wisdom about God. God stands waiting for you to come home. He loves you that much. In fact, it says when somebody comes back to God, the angels start rejoicing. I take that literally. I take it literally that when, when a Christian repents or when someone comes to Christ, that heaven breaks out in a wild, raucous praise for God for what has happened. Today, we offer to you, if, if you've wanted to come back to the Lord to, to change some things in your life, we'd love to help you if there's a way that we can help you with that. If you 
are ready to put him on in baptism, oh, we'd love to be a part of that. That is a celebration. Whatever you need, if we can help you as a church, please come while together we stand and while we sing.